The early era of video games is quite possibly one of the most interesting if we're talking about designs. It was a period of time where the unwritten rules of game design weren't quite written yet. Well, that analogy fell apart pretty quick. What I mean to say is that there was once a time where there were really no proven methods of game design. Originally, games were often based around one singular mechanic with one very obvious objective. Back then, game design was more about programming controller movements and hitboxes, or getting as much use out of your limited hardware as possible. Not to discount the effort that took to design a game back then, but most designers didn't have to worry about teaching the player through difficulty curves or level design, because there really wasn't any need to. But as technology improved, games often became bigger and more complex, and game design started to take the form as we know it today. However, these developers were the pioneers of what would be the Wild West of game design. That's not to say it was lawless or chaotic, but there wasn't a practice methodology to make your game fun or intuitive. There wasn't a class that you could attend to teach you how to incrementally offer rewards to players. There wasn't a website that gave you insight to developers' ideas and mindsets. And there certainly wasn't videos made by awesome people talking about game design that you could subscribe to for more great content. While this lack of familiarity led to some... questionable design choices, it also led to some of the most interesting designs as well. I mean, even Nintendo wasn't afraid to completely flip the script for the sake of figuring out what works. The original Legend of Zelda was an overhead action-adventure game that focused on exploration and experimentation. The sequel, a side-scrolling action RPG with a heavy focus on combat. Why? Well, because they could. This led to the NES having games such as tarot card simulators and point-and-click RPGs about vegetables. Games developed during this era would end up defining mechanics, series, and even genres for decades, and will be remembered as some of the most influential games of all time. The others made James Rolfe a lot of money. However, as we discussed before on this channel, a game's success and failure aren't always indicative of its quality. As crazy as it is to imagine, we could have lived in a world where we were complaining about Pinball Quest 13's board layout being entirely too linear, how the bumper juggle mechanic was just too boring to be interesting, and how Jalico hasn't been the same since they merged with Sunsoft. That is, if somehow Pinball Quest gained more traction than Final Fantasy. It's only been recently that people are discovering games decades after their initial release, and at this point it's pretty well thought that all those hidden gems were discovered by now. Though, there are still a couple of games I haven't heard talked about. Not because their games are simply underrated, but because their designs feature things that would be included with some of the best games ever made, years before those games were released. Made by a company who, if they had any sort of success, might have been considered the most innovative company in that era. This is Design Documentaries, an in-depth look at a game's design, history, and legacy. And first, we're taking a look at Culture Brain's The Magic of She, Her, Uh... The Magic of She, Her... 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 The Magic of She, Her, Zaid... The Magic of She, Her, Zadi... The Magic of She, Her, Zadi... Was that right? The Famicom's Arabian Dormu Sherazado. All the way back to September 3rd, 1987, the day that Magic of Scheherazade was released for the Nintendo Famicom. It was an action RPG developed and published by Culture Brain, a Japanese development studio ran by Yukio Tanaka and the Yumanosuke development team. 
This was during a time when many Japanese developers didn't use the real name for their staff so that competing studios wouldn't steal them from the company. That's why you had weird pen names like Yuki-chan's Papa. But unfortunately, it means that there isn't much information regarding the development of Scheherazade. What we do know is that the magic of Scheherazade was probably based on the setting of 1001 Arabian Nights. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the story, it's about a king who found out his wife was cheating on him. Stricken with anger at her betrayal, he had her executed, and each night he would marry another woman only to kill her the next day so she wouldn't have the chance to cheat on him. After doing this 1,000 times, he married Scheherazade. To prolong her life, she would tell the king a story, but at the end of each night, she'd leave the story on a cliffhanger, resolving it to finish it the next night and then start another, resulting in 1,001 stories all told within one story. What does this have to do with the magic of Scheherazade? Well, outside of the Arabic setting and the princess sharing the same name, not really a whole lot. Most likely it was named because of the relevance to the setting. Scimitars, bazaars, genies, protocol droids, all within the realms of possibility in 1001 Arabian Nights. But as far as I know, it's not related to any of the stories. The game starts off by telling you that the once peaceful Arabia is being attacked by the demons. Summoned by the evil wizard Saraban for his evil desire. A great hero tried to stop him, but he failed. As a result, his girlfriend was kidnapped, he lost all his memories, he was even sent into a completely different time. Because apparently killing him wouldn't have been effective or needed, you just want to rub salt in the wound sometimes, I get it. It turns out that magician was us. A time spirit known as Koronya. Ah, uh, I get it, because she's a cat. Finds you so you can defeat Saraban, rescue the royal family, and the princess Scheherazade. And like that, you're in the game proper. If this is the first time you're seeing this game, you might get the impression that it's just a straight up Zelda clone. And there's no doubt it had taken several inspirations from Nintendo's title. From some of the shops, overworld combat, and exploration, it's easy to get that impression. I mean, even their money is called rupias. That's less effort than most soda companies use in naming their Dr. Pepper ripoff. Looking beyond the surface level though, there's a lot going on that differentiates it from Zelda. For example, Scheherazade had a class system, allowing you to choose between fighter, magician, or saint. As you can expect, the fighter is better at melee, the magician is better at spells, and the saint is... actually not great at either. You might think that Scheherazade stole this from another popular RPG at the time, Final Fantasy. But actually, Final Fantasy wouldn't be released for another three and a half months. That makes Scheherazade one of the first class-based RPGs on the console. Though you're not required to commit to a class, you're able to change them at a mosque for a fee. And in fact, changing your class is required several times throughout the game. A certain character might only trust a saint, or certain monsters can only be defeated by a magician. But really, it's about the small details of Scheherazade that makes it interesting. For example, you just don't go into a store and buy items like you would in any other RPG, but you also have the opportunity to talk them down in price. Bargaining is also factored by what class you're playing. A saint is culturally more trustworthy than a magician, so they tend to get the better deals. You can also borrow money from the shops, which actually starts to accumulate interest if you owe for too long. All these minor additions make the world seem more alive in ways that many games don't even now. Some towns also have casinos where you can gamble on your hard-earned rupias, but only if you're a fighter or a magician because saints don't gamble. It's a simple roulette game, nothing elaborate, but it's a great way to earn some money. just keep playing and you eventually... Oh, well, you can't win every game, but you just try again and yet... Ah, it's just some bad luck, but that's what the loans are for, right? I'll win back what I lost and pay it back before I owe any interest and... But I'll just... Then I'll... And then... Well, the important part is that we had fun. 
Besides, it's just a game, not like debt actually means anything. What's the worst that could- I just lost the game because I went into debt. Like, seriously, think about that for a second. There's a game on the NES as far back as 1987 where you lose because you have a gambling addiction. Man, the Magic of Scheherazade was warning us about loot boxes 30 years ago. So restarting the game as a saint to save me from myself, we leave the town and continue on our journey. And here is where it seems the most like Zelda. You fight against overworld enemies, some which are functionally similar to other enemies in Zelda. The overworld is somewhat open despite it being separated into chapters, and there are dungeons to explore. The game even has secret stairs where you go down and find people that give you money. And despite the two year gap between the games, it admittedly doesn't have the same polish as Zelda. Uh, yeah, when I said Scheherazade was an action RPG, I didn't mean it had RPG elements. I meant that it was an action game that for some reason has traditional turn-based RPG combat as well. In a fair bit of irony though, it would be Zelda that would end up being a Magicka Scheherazade clone. That's right, The Legend of Zelda would end up using a mechanic found in Culture Brain's title. Throughout the game there would be these time gates that would either send you back or forward through time, in a similar but slightly changed world. And traversing these time gates would be important for beating the game. This is very similar to a mechanic that was used in The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, a game that wouldn't be released until four years later on the Super Famicom. And it wasn't just Zelda either. There were other games that had borrowed elements from Scheherazade. Chrono Trigger also had a time travel mechanic that required you to manipulate events in the past to solve problems for the future. But the magic of Scheherazade was one of the earliest games that featured this concept. For example, in the first chapter of the game, you're told that a powerful genie used to live in the area around 50 years ago. So the natural assumption is to travel back in time and recruit him. But he resides in a town that doesn't exist in the future because it was sinking into the ocean. And sure enough, when you get there where it is in the present, it's replaced by an ocean cliff. However, with the genie in your party, you can now visit the old city, which is now populated by mermaids and this particularly stubborn man. Another example is that you can plant a tree in the past and have it blossom in the future. Or you travel back in time to discover that the town speaks a language you don't understand. So you have to go back to the future to find a protocol droid that learned the language to translate it. And mind you, this was eight whole years before Chrono Trigger would be released. Speaking of, do you want to know another thing that Scheherazade did before Chrono Trigger? The concept of party-based techniques. At the beginning of each RPG battle, out of a potential 11 other party members, you choose two to accompany you. Picking the right combination results in a formation, granting you special attacks which are particularly effective against certain groups of enemies. This is technically a precursor to Chrono Trigger's techs, which functions as special attacks that you have when you have two or more party members, which ended up inspiring Final Fantasy XI's weapon skills. So in some strange way, the magic of Scheherazade contributed to Final Fantasy XI's development. You learn these formations by going to college and passing an exam, or if you fail enough times you can simply bribe the teacher to pass you. But why pay off the teacher when you can just pay the monsters not to fight you instead? This meant that Scheherazade implemented a bribing system 8 days before Megami Tensai would release in Japan with a similar mechanic. And that's not even going into all the original elements that the Magic of Scheherazade had that were never replicated, such as the ability to hire mercenaries to help absorb hits and deal damage during the RPG encounters. The game even features a time progression mechanic which, after a set amount of time, the Alalart Solar Eclipse will occur, basically acting as a pseudo day-night cycle. During this eclipse, you'll be able to cast some of the most powerful spells in the game, and you'll be extra lucky during the casino. You know what that means?
Now, I'm not saying that Zelda or Chrono Trigger stole these elements from the magic of Scheherazade. Scheherazade was most likely pulling in these tropes and concepts from other things. It is, however, a testament to how revolutionary the game was for featuring these mechanics that wouldn't be used for half a decade or longer. You could say that Magicka Scheherazade was ahead of its time. Because, you know, Link to the Past, Chrono Trigger, you, you get it now? It's about time. It just wasn't the magic of Scheherazade, though. Culture Brain was developing innovative titles back when they were known as Nihon Games. Shanghai Kid was an arcade game released back in 1985. It was a one-on-one -on -one fighting game in the same vein as Street Fighter, two years before Street Fighter released. Where it differs is the main mechanic. Instead of just mashing buttons, you have to use your mind's eye, which tells you where you need to attack and defend. Sort of like quick time events before those were a thing. It was also the first fighting game to feature combos, well before Street Fighter 2 accidentally stumbled on the Discovery and started including it as a main feature. This eventually led into the development of Flying Dragon, the secret scrolls for the NES, also known as Hiryu no Ken, which is surprisingly nothing too crazy. It took the concept of the original Shanghai Kid, then added some beat-em-up elements between each of the game's tournaments, which the Mind's Eye mechanic returns. It doesn't get really crazy until the third game in the series, Flying Warriors. At first, it just seems to be an iteration of the previous entry. The only strange thing you might notice is the weirdly Judeo-Christian overtones for a Nintendo game. An angel lost her robe and she can't get back to heaven without it. And for some reason, a demon has it. Oh, if the Prince of Freaking Darkness is in this game, I swear to God. After you defeat the demon, you're fighting an another demon. And you're now brought into a boss fight that uses the Mind's Eye mechanic once again. And now there are experience points? The insanity doesn't stop there, because after you return the robe, the angel leads you to an orb which transforms you into a flying warrior, a Super Sentai-like hero. And for some reason, now there are turn-based RPG-style battles. Like, seriously, what is this game? It all slowed down when Culture Brain released Ultimate Fighter for the Super Nintendo. This is still part of the Flying Dragon series, called Hironoken S Golden Fighter on a Super Famicom, but it no longer features the platforming elements and it's now a traditional beat-em-up. Well, traditional in the sense that it still uses the Mind's Eye mechanic and there's an RPG mode for some reason. By the time Flying Dragon for the Nintendo 64 was released, the series had cycled back to its fighting game roots. It looks and plays kind of like Virtua Fighter. A lot like Virtua Fighter. And don't worry, I know what you're thinking, but this game was released four years after Virtua Fighter, so there really isn't a whole lot to say about this. Not even the mind's eye mechanic is prevalent as it once was. While still having the option for it, the gameplay isn't focused around it. It seems like Culture Brain cooled down with the innovation and made a seemingly normal fighting game for once. That is, if you were playing the virtual version of the game. Flying Dragon actually contained two games, a more realistic version and another version called SD Mode. As you can probably guess, SD Mode used super deformed version of the game's characters. The core of the gameplay was playing through tournament mode to gain experience, level up equipment, and wear items to customize your characters. The biggest notable difference, though, is in how you used your special moves. Rather than having to input a special combination to do a special move, they were activated by holding a direction and a button. Also, did I mention that this game was released on December 18, 1997, a year before Super Smash Bros. would have used a similar mechanic? And that wasn't Culture Brain's only prominent series, and there's actually one you might even remember. Baseball Simulator 1.000 was their foray into the sports genre. And as you can expect by the name, it's a baseball game. No random RPG elements or battles, no crazy stories, just a plain old American pastime with nothing weird or strange about it at all. Well, except for the occasional 130 mile per hour pitch with enough power to snap a bat, and pitchers with the ability to stop time, but that's 
probably pretty normal, I guess. I mean, it's a simulation, so I, I don't know. I don't know baseball. And finally, there was their Super Chinese series, or as we knew it in the West, Ninja Brothers. It looks like your typical JRPG for the era. It has experience points, NPCs, shops, equipment, and even magic. You wouldn't think otherwise until you got into your first random encounter. Whereas Flying Warrior was a beat-em-up with RPG elements, Neato. Ninja Brothers ends up being an RPG with beat-em-up elements. Each encounter having this strange action segment where you have to hit enemies and punch rocks. And the games feature quirky dialogue and situations similar to a style you would see with the Mother series. Released two months before that game. And even Scheherazade makes a cameo in a later entry in the series. There really is no doubt that Culture Brain was making some of the most innovative games at the time. But despite that, they never really achieved any sort of name recognition. It seemed that sometime in the mid-90s, Culture Brain just disappeared. Though, believe it or not, Culture Brain still exists. Just not in the same way as we used to know them. Most of the games we've seen released in the West weren't just done by Culture Brain, but also Culture Brain USA, which was the company's localization studio based in the United States. It was responsible for bringing almost every Culture Brain title to our shores, and they weren't just a simple translation team, but rather a legitimate localization studio, often changing the entire game to fit the audience. For example, Arabian Doramu Sherezado, or what roughly translates to Arabian Dream Sherezad, is very different than its American release. The most obvious change is how the game looks. I mean, our protagonist goes from a fairly simple warrior to this goofy looking guy. Like, seriously, I... Look how he runs! Also, several of the enemies had also changed to look more menacing as well. And it didn't just stop at the sprite art either, the music has also changed. The maps are much larger in the Japanese version, and places are moved and changed around. There isn't even a casino in the third town, and you probably guess how that made me feel. There are more underground areas to explore, and they're also bigger as well. You don't even start with the rod or scimitar like you do in the American version. Likewise, Hiryu no Ken S. Golden Fighter was also different than its western counterpart, including several changes to the sprite art as well. The hero having a more anime style look to him, as well as going from the Super Sentai style designs to Dollar General superhero knockoffs. Listen, I didn't say all the changes were good. The American release also changed the gameplay as well, with boss fights happening earlier and more frequent, and the layout of enemies even being different. Despite all these changes to cater to a more Western audience, Culture Brain USA did not have any sort of success. Ultimate Fighter was supposedly the last game the studio had worked on. The only game that Culture Brain released in America after that was Flying Dragon for the Nintendo 64, and that was published and most likely localized by Natsumi. Culture Brain USA had silently closed its doors sometime between the release of these two games. And with it went Culture Brain's interest in releasing anything for the Western market. Culture Brain remained a fairly prominent developer in Japan though. Hiro no Ken had over a dozen titles in Japan, Baseball Simulator had seven games to R2, and they still continued to create new intellectual property. They created a game about raising ferrets, which positioned them for their hamster raising simulations. Then they created everything from Mahjong games and beetle battle simulations to princess dressing sims. At one point, Culture Brain was so successful in Japan that it had its own art school. However, even in Japan, Culture Brain started fading into obscurity. Their output would slow down until it was a nearly six year hiatus between games. Even then, they only released two titles. Then in 2016, Culture Brain rebranded into Culture Brain Excel and started to release games again. Well, kind of. After another three year gap, they released games like The Game 15 and The Game 15 Volume 2, which were just a collection of mini games for the 3DS. It's fairly obvious that the days where they were releasing games years ahead of its time in terms of gameplay, mixing genres, and 
creating truly unique games were well behind them at this point. From what I can tell, even their last entry in their baseball simulator series didn't have the special pitches. And there hasn't been a sequel to Hiryu no Ken, Super Chinese, or Baseball Simulator in over a decade, and no plan to revive them either. Culture Brain is more or less a shadow of what it once was. Now to be fair, I haven't played their newest Japanese games. It's entirely possible that those games are fine, and I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that their hamster raising simulations were the first Battle Royale game. However, it seems that the culture brain that existed in the 8 and 16-bit era is no more. And the worst part about it is, culture brain most likely failed because their games were so ahead of its time. During the early days of the Nintendo Entertainment System, gaming had just entered this new era where they weren't nearly as limited by hardware. You went from a 32 kilobyte cartridge and 128 bytes of RAM with the Atari 2600 to upwards of 1 megabyte in storage and a 2 whole kilobytes of RAM with the NES. Many games were doing things that weren't even thought of just a couple of years ago, like screen scrolling or an actual ending. Everything felt like a new experience. It didn't seem like Culture Brain's games broke any molds because there really wasn't any to break. Adding RPG elements to your game was interesting, but that didn't really mean much when RPGs themselves were fairly new on console. Likewise, using time travel was interesting, but at that point it was no more novel than being a cyberspace kabuki warrior. That is by no means saying that Culture Brain was any less ambitious. Their games were often trying to do much more than their contemporaries. However, to borrow a phrase, they might have been punching well above its weight class. While their games were often solid experiences for the time, a lot of their titles lacked polish, and they made a lot of the same mistakes that other games during that time had made. A lot of the designs weren't the most intuitive, and that's only exacerbated by the shifting genres. Culture Brain probably didn't have the budget, hardware, or the experience needed to fulfill the vision of the games they wanted to make. Games like Link to the Past and Chrono Trigger might have borrowed concepts from Scheherazade, but both those games had an advantage over the early NES title. For starters, by the time these games started featuring these mechanics, that foundation was set. The popularity of Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior had set the expectations of what an RPG was, so when Chrono Trigger was released, it blew away those expectations. Likewise, because it was on a more capable system and had a bigger budget, it could do far more with the time traveling concept. Not to mention the years of experience it was able to build off of, from plenty of other games making mistakes that they could learn from. I honestly wouldn't be at all surprised if someone at Squaresoft had looked at Scheherazade and said, this is a good concept, but I could do better. And that happens in game design, even to this very day. Just back then we didn't have companies trying to sue each other from iterating on games. Still, it's a shame that the magic of Scheherazade never got the recognition it deserved. While Flying Dragon had over a dozen sequels, Scheherazade was mostly overlooked by Culture Brain. It didn't even have a virtual console release and was overlooked for Culture Brain's retro bit multi-cart. There was a sequel announced in Nintendo Power Volume 18 but there wasn't any screenshots or at this point even known to have been in development. The only thing that was known about it is that it was going to be a prequel. I also found rumors that there were also talks of a sequel being on a Game Boy and PlayStation, but I couldn't find anything about that either. However, with the trademark long since abandoned, Culture Brain Excel's current direction, and just an overall lack of interest in a game, chances are we'll never see a sequel. And unfortunately, that's where the story ends. Ultimately though, that isn't the most important part. It's the fact that companies like Culture Brain were the pioneers. What we know about game design was forged in this era, and not just by successes or even the well-known failures, but the games that were trying new and interesting things. Every game was contributing to the discussion in their own ways, exploring new opportunities and setting the foundation for the future of game design. 
and pushing boundaries to find out what worked and what didn't. So while Culture Brain might never have had success, it might have even been forgotten, their contribution still echoes to this day. In a way, innovation and ambition aren't entirely personal experiences. The first designer who thought of the concept of an experience point probably didn't know that they would define an entire progression system for thousands of games. And who knows, maybe we wouldn't have had games like Chrono Trigger if the Magic Scheherazade didn't exist. Which is why it's important to do something, even if you don't feel confident that it will succeed. Because even in failure, you might still end up changing the world and influencing others for years to come. In a way, you can say that gaining experience helps others build character. Hey, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't be afraid to throw a like and maybe subscribe if you haven't already. I want to give a special thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. Their contribution is what allows me to make videos like these. If you want to see your name here, you can click on that Patreon button or check out the description to find more ways to support the channel. So until next video, this is Soberdorf reminding you to keep building character.